Hello, hello, welcome, and welcome back to the United Mates Football Podcast. Today, I'm joined in Los Angeles by my co-host Joe, who's in our hometown, London. We've got a special guest on the call, as usual, who we're both very excited to chat with. During his ongoing playing career, he's taken the long way around to reach the very top as an international footballer. His journey began in the United Counties League, the ninth tier of English football, where with his local club, St. Alves Town, he would deliver prolifically on the pitch whilst also delivering off of it as a young postman for the Royal Mail. After scoring for fun there, he was snapped up by conference side Newport County and with the Welsh club, he would be promoted to the Football League. Since then, he's very much moved on from non-league football a successful spell at Peterborough, who had rejected him in his youth, would follow, and he'd earn a big money move to Queen's Park Rangers, as well as his first caps for Northern Ireland. Spells with Sheffield United and Scottish club Hearts came next, which brings us to today. Our guest currently bags the goals for Charlton Athletic. Meanwhile, he's working on his golf game and studying sports science at Manchester Metropolitan University too. We welcome Connor Washington to the United Mates Football Podcast. Connor is an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Cheers for joining us. How are you doing? How have you been enjoying the off season so far? Hi guys, nice to meet you. Uh, hell of an introduction, Matt. I'm not sure I can live up to all of that, to be honest. Um, yeah, it's all good, thank you. Uh, feels like we've had so long off now, if I'm honest. Only about two or three weeks in, but just building the fitness back up now, and like you say, working on the golf game, ready, ready to get back. It does feel like a, a long time since football. I guess the Champions League final was kind of marking the, the official end of the season. We've got the Euros coming around, luckily. So for us as viewers, I guess, looking forward to that. Um, Joe, I'm sorry. I, I actually, I don't have an intro for you like the one that I did have for Connor, but I guess we'll, we'll just move on. Um, Joe, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Hope maybe for the next um, interview, I, I can get a good intro as well. Haven't scored as many goals sadly as Colin, but um, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good, thanks. Um, it's been a nice sunny week in London, so I can't complain. Um, but yeah, Connor, thanks a lot for joining us. And um, when we have guests on our podcast, we will always start um, by asking an icebreaker question. So we have got one for you, Connor. And we, we got we went on your Twitter. And we noticed that you're an owner, probably a proud owner of a big green egg barbecue. They're great. They're I great. am. Yes. Um, however, I imagine you're even more proud about being a father. So we thought we'd combine the two things together. And it got us thinking about the Dr. Zeus classic, green eggs and ham. So what we'd like to know from you, Connor, is what is your favorite children's book? But we'll give you a bit of time to think about that. So I'll share mine and then Kaito will share his. I think one of my favorite children's books from back in the day was probably Horrid Henry. Those, those books, they were always quite good fun to read. Kai, solid choice. About, yeah, you know, solid choice. They, they did the job back in the day. Kai, how about you? Um, what, what were your favorite children's books? Yeah, also a Horrid Henry fan in the building. Otherwise, I think I might be cheating as I typically do with the icebreakers. This is more of a like a young adult book, maybe like a teen book. Uh, and it's got to be the Alex Ryder series, uh, essentially yeah, James Bond. Good. Stormbreaker. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, all the great yeah. names, all the dramatic yeah. names. But yeah, it was like James Bond for kids and, you know, gadgets. He would travel around the world saving saving the world as well. I didn't. I didn't think he was the most kind of likable main character. He was a bit of a moody teenager. Um, but well, yeah. it, I was. I was hooked. There, you know, the twists were pretty outrageous. I think at the end of one of the books literally might have ended with something like the words "Alex was dead." And then, of course, there's like another three, <laughs> three books. Um, so you know, they 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 dug their claws into us and kind of got the most out of the franchise. I think there was even a movie as well. Um, it was. Yeah, it was not very good. Yeah. No. <laughs> considering how many books there were i think they probably intended to make a bunch of movies and it's yeah it's kind of a sign of the success of that one that it was just the, the standalone movie but um joe i'm assuming you you're an alex Ryder fan as well right yeah, yeah. I, I i read them all, all of those books good old anthony horowitz the author um i think he's from around yeah. london um i read quite yeah. a few of his books actually yeah 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 he's a good author although yeah like you said connor that the stormbreaker film was pretty shocking but <laughs> Well, well, we'll stop talking about Alex Ryder now. And Connor, you've had some time to think about it. What is your favourite children's book? So I'm a pretty avid reader myself, to be honest. Um, we read quite a lot to Max, uh, our three-year-old. And his, probably my personal favourite of his, because obviously I wouldn't really remember reading too many books for three-year-olds. But i um, big fan of Charlie Cook's favourite book. Just anything with a good rhyme in there, to be honest. Julia, I think it's Julia Donaldson. We've got a lot of her books. Um, and I think I enjoy I enjoy them more than he does, to be honest. And the Gruffalo, you can't beat a classic. 
he does enjoy he does enjoy the Gruffalo. On a on a personal note, I mean, I was a big Harry Potter fan. I mean, like probably gone through it six or seven times, I'd imagine. Yeah, I was a bit of a bit of a book man, to be honest. And also the I can't remember who who wrote them. I think it was quite a few different different authors, but the Horrible Sciences book. Big big fans of them. Uh, read read all of them a few times. I actually bought them preemptively, hoping that Maxwell will get to like about ten or eleven and want to read them. They're sat in his sat in his room right now. I'm not sure he's quite there yet, to be honest. But yeah, I'm a, I'm an avid reader. I still read a lot now. So um, yeah, it was good. Great icebreaker. <laughs> well, on from I suppose yeah, children's books to your actual childhood, Connor. So I guess back rather than on. And what was it that? made you fall in love with the beautiful game? What are some early football memories that shaped your dream to become a professional player? Uh, so my, my, I wouldn't say my family was a, an enormous football family. To be honest. My dad is a big rugby fan, um, but my brother liked football. He's seven, seven and eight years older than me. So um, it was him. He's, he's, I've just noticed the scarves and stuff behind you. He's a big Arsenal fan. Uh, so uh, not so much anymore, but I was a serious Arsenal fan growing up. Um, once you start playing, it all gets a bit, a bit weird supporting teams for some reason. I don't know why, but um, yeah, big Arsenal fans. We used to go down the park, and just us two really. Just he used to go and go. I used to go and goal, and just used to smash balls at each other. To be honest, and it was good for me because obviously he's six, seven years older than me, seven, eight years. I can't even remember what the exact is. Seven. We'll go with seven. Um, so yeah, it was great because he was bigger, stronger, faster, and obviously I learned a lot from him. In, in that respect as well and I started playing quite early I think I must have been about six or seven because I used to go to my brother's games he was in a local team so I obviously was desperate to do that as well so I joined a local team relatively young playing I think it was five five or six a side initially and then worked my way through the age groups. Fantastic well you know we've all, we all have our story I'm sad to know you're an, you're an Arsenal fan at least where I'm a Spurs fan you see so yeah that's, oh, that's not that's what I want to hear but I'll, um, I'll, I'll let you off Connor I'll let you off but let's um, let's talk a bit about St Ives Town and in particular your final season at St Ives Town where you scored 52 goals in 45 matches which is obviously a a fantastic achievement. So I was just interested in kind of the, I guess at the moment you're in the build up to the, the upcoming 2021, 22 season in the build up to that particular season. Was there anything you changed about your preparations? Maybe it was the way you were training or the way sort of mentally you approached the game that you think might have kind of led to that quite frankly, ridiculous number of goals you ended up scoring. No, I think, I think that must have been the year that so I went to uni for a year and I decided that I wasn't going to go back. So I think maybe I just applied myself more in the pre-season. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I've never actually thought about that, what was different. I think a lot of it was probably down to physical side of it as well because I'd left uni, so I wasn't drinking every day and being stupid. So, um yeah, it must have been. It must have been to do with the preparation. Physically, I was bigger, stronger. I was starting to obviously become more of a man. I was about nineteen at the time, I think nineteen or twenty. But in terms of, did I focus particularly on football? I, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I dropped out of uni to apply for the RAF, so football was still just very much playing with my mates, and we had we had a great bunch of lads there. It was it was really good. Um, and I think the funny thing is, I don't think I scored for a maybe the first 10 games or I didn't have many in the first 10 games I think I ended up with like 24 in the last 15 or 16 games it was just crazy just as a as a striker you just get on a run um and everything was going in to be honest it was it was great to be a part of that and um, I really enjoyed that we had a good season as well I think we won two trophies as well um so yeah I think it was just a perfect storm of things to be honest I don't think there was anything in particular um, it just all seemed to come together, as, as probably so many of these stories do, That you, the guys that you interview. Yeah, these things, you know, they work out one way or another. And it's interesting that you mention the RAF and a, a year at uni as well. Obviously, I reference the, the work for the Royal Mail as a, as a postman. And in, in your very early days um, playing uh, before you kind of had your success with St. Ives, I believe uh, you were turned down for apprenticeships at Peterborough and, and Norwich so it sounds like given the amount of things you kept yourself busy with you were keeping your options open on, on some level but did those sort of experiences of kind of the rejection from Peterborough and Norwich um, discourage you at all or 
or rather did they kind of galvanize you and, and motivate you even more to succeed? Because obviously eventually you've honed in on, on this professional football career and the rest is kind of in, in your past. Yeah, I'm probably a really strange case in, in this respect, to be honest, because I was never the I was never the best player. I wasn't the best player in my year group um, all the way through school up until sort of year 11, sixth form. I was, I was good. I was one of probably three or four, like, really good players. Um, there was one standout who was at Norwich. Uh, I think he made his first team debut. Um, so I was never never tipped to be a professional footballer. It wasn't, I mean, obviously where I came from, it's in between Peterborough and Cambridge, the catchment area is small. So if you are a real standout, then you will get picked up. But it's not like, probably like it is around London, where if you're a half decent player, you probably get trials everywhere and you might do a couple of years here, there. It's not really like that in Cambridge. Um, so I, yeah, I'd never thought about being a footballer. I'd never dreamed of it. Nobody had ever suggested it to me up until I was probably 18 or 19 to be honest and I think a lot of that is probably down to development as a player and physically as well but yeah I was a good player there was no like but I was like I say one of one of three or four really good players around the area so when when I got the chance to go to I think I went to Peterborough first I went to Peterborough twice and Norwich once so both times I went to Peterborough it was just a it was just an experience for me. I wasn't particularly, I don't remember expecting to get anything out of it. I think one of them was actually, I don't know if you guys would have watched it. It was, uh, I think it was called Big Ron Manager, Ron Atkinson, oh, for yeah. some reason, was in at Peterborough. Yeah, but I, I was in that. That was, so they had a trial game with it within that. Um, and Ron Atkinson was going to pick one of the lads out of the lineup to get a scholarship, basically. Um, but I played in the game. Obviously, I didn't get a scholarship. So, um, yeah, it was just more excitement to be involved in something like that. And then the one at Norwich, I can't remember where Norwich were. They were Championship or they might have even been Premiership at the time. But it was another one where I just went and enjoyed it and had a good time playing against really good players. But at the same time, I really didn't expect to, to, be, given a, to be given a contract or anything. And because it wasn't something that happened at our school, I mean, we only had the one really good player, even in... I'm thinking about year groups above me, below me. We didn't have loads of players in academy, so it was almost a bit... He was the outlier, massively, uh, the guy that went on to play for Norwich. So. Yeah, I can relate. You were talking about playing you know, in London, for instance, and the amount of clubs that if you're a half-decent player... I was just about a half-decent player, and I managed to get a trial at, at Millwall, so not really comparing myself to you, someone who's actually gone on and, and, and made a professional career of it. But um, something that who knows you might eventually make a, a professional uh, career of is is golf we know that you're very into that so we have kind of a quick game connor and um actually it's something you know your passion for golf that you and a few of our former guests share in common um frank cadrew someone we spoke with in particular that guy definitely fancies himself as a bit of a golfer i know uh, enoch shawunmi lives in naples florida these days the land of golf courses excuse my dog in the background if you can hear some scratching <laughs> but um we do want to keep talking about football and uh, connor you'll You'll know very well that finishing one under par on a hole is called a birdie. So speaking of birdies, I'm going to name some birds that are strongly associated with certain clubs, basically teams whose nicknames are birds. And you and Joe have to tell me which team I'm talking about. So whichever one of you answers correctly first gets the point. I am just going to silence my dog. Give me just one moment. Um, back to the birds and the football teams. So yeah, just if you know the answer, shout it out. I'll keep track of the scores. Here come the names. I'm looking for the teams associated with these following birds. And I'll start with maybe an obvious place to start, given what we've spoken about, the Canaries. Norwich. Okay, so oh. yeah. Connor's, Connor's gone one up. Uh, I've got a bunch more of these. You ready, guys? The yeah. Seagulls. Brighton. Brighton. Okay, I'll Draw. give that to Joe. we got one all. <laughs> Draw. I've got, coming up next, the Bluebirds. Got it. Oh, that oh, one I wouldn't have to be. draw. That one's a draw. Okay, so we're still tied. I've got some delay here, I reckon. <laughs> I've got some LA delay. Well, Joe's over in London, so I think both of you should be should be experiencing a bit, <laughs> a bit of delay. Um, but next up, the Owls. Sheffield yeah. Wednesday. That one's going to be Connor's. Very forceful in with Sheffield Wednesday there. So Connor's pulled ahead. Next up, the Swans. Swansea. Swansea. Oof. That's mine. For, the sake of, for the sake of it right now, yeah, we'll give it to Joe. So we're, we're, we're tied up again. <laughs> Moving into Jubious. the final stretch. <laughs> Got uh, the Magpies. Newcastle. Newcastle. 
we'll see if we have to come back to this delay <laughs> later. But for the minute, Doe's going to edge ahead. Next up is the Robins. Bristol City. Bristol City. Oh, okay, that one's got to be Joe's. So we'll, well call that one prior a draw. Oh, right. Connor, Connor's behind by behind by one. Technical, yeah, technical issues kind of maybe not the perfect game to play. But I've got two more. And this next one is the Eagles. Oh, Palace. Okay, oh, Joe. Like, and then yeah. just for I guess for it to round it out, this one is a bit a bit left field. It's definitely not their main nickname. And I kind of had to research this one. The Peacocks. Oh. Um they're a Premier League team, but they they're are. a more, more recent Premier League team. And I had no idea that this was their nickname or one of their nicknames. Current Premier League team. Terrible nickname, whichever it is. <laughs> yeah, it's got absolutely... I mean, obviously, there must be a historical link, but if you were to look at the crest, you would have no clue. Their other nickname, I guess, would be, I think, just the Whites. Oh, Leeds. Leeds? Yeah, yeah, that's, they'll call that a tie. Apparently, apparently, a nickname for Leeds, if you, if you look it up, is, is the Peacocks. I think... Well, who knows? I reckon we'll call it a, a tie. Why not? Because like Joe had done, like, to be fair. He got the Eagle Palace where I didn't get it. So, all right then. Very humble, Connor. Um, Joe Joe wins this one. Um, I guess on the actual golf course, I reckon you would kind of wipe the floor or wipe the green with with both of us. But, <laughs> um, yeah, Joe gets the W. Yeah, definitely. Well played. Well played. Um, haven't really gone on the greens too much, but um, yeah, let's go back to your career, Connor. Obviously, we spoke a bit earlier about that um, incredible season at St. Ives Town, which um, got you a move um, to Newport County. It was actually the late Justin Edinburgh, obviously sadly passed away a couple of years ago, who, um, who brought you to Newport. And obviously, it was a, a massive step up, really, from the ninth tier of English football to um, the fifth tier in the, the conference. Um, how challenging was that for you, making such a, a big step up? Yeah, I mean, it was it was probably the biggest challenge of my whole career, to be honest. I mean, if you look at my career as a whole, it looks pretty linear in terms of being an upward trajectory, but it felt it's felt like anything but that, to be honest. Um, and the Newport one was so tough. I mean, I think I joined in the October or November, and I might have made my debut after the new year. Well, actually, I think it was Boxing Day, or just before Boxing Day. My first start was Boxing Day, I think, or something, something like that. But I was miles off of it, like so far away from it. It was incredible. Um, wasn't getting in squads. Uh, found it really tough. The even just like the dressing room and stuff, I found really tough. Um, I've always been, I've always been pretty boisterous and enjoyed the banter and stuff like that. Obviously, from playing non-league and stuff. But I mean, this was just relentless. It was constant, and obviously sharing a dressing room with grown men when you're 19, 20, with no life experience whatsoever. Um, and it wasn't like I had the football to, to, to fall back on because um, I was struggling with that side of it as well. So, yeah, it was, it was a tough period of my life. And yeah, obviously, I'm miles stronger for it now. But um, it was, I, I, like you said, I, was in, I, was, I was, wasn't even in the squad for the promotion um, at Wembley. I, I got left out of that. So I think I went back with the attitude in the summer, like, listen, I've got a year left. I remember, I remember so vividly speaking to my mum and saying, listen, I've got a year left. So... I'm going to have a proper pre-season, see how it goes. And if not, I'll just go back to what I was doing before. And that sort of that sort of attitude, coupled with um, obviously getting a full pre-season under my belt, was was the real catalyst for me to, to kick on. Yeah, well, like you said, obviously, um, you would kick on at Newport. They would get promoted in your first season. First time they'd be back in the Football League in 25 years. And you'd had you had a really good season there. Funnily enough, actually, I I saw you score at St James's Park. Um, I was oh, really? I was behind the goal. Yeah, very hungover that day. I went to Exeter Uni. I was there when you you had a good game. I remember the Newport yeah. Newport fans were in a very fine voice. But um, I was just wondering. I guess you know you you had a great season in that second year. It was Newport's first um, season back in the football league for twenty five years. Do you think that kind of special element of it being quite an exciting time for the club maybe spurred you on in your own game as well? I don't know at Rodney Parade if the atmosphere was just a little bit louder and like does that as a does that give you a bit more motivation when you're playing in these you know exciting moments? Yeah, for sure. I think like I sort of alluded to earlier, uh, football is very much about opportunity, luck, and like I said, creating that sort of perfect storm of an environment to to thrive in and. I was really lucky to be a part of that at Newport. Um, 
we had, like you say, Justin Edinburgh was unbelievable man manager, great guy, uh, had really good people around him. And we were just sort of a ragtag group of people that had not, none of us had really had too much league experience. Um, Justin had assembled the squad. It was just like uh, just a crazy mix of people, personalities, as well as players. And we were, we were just so unfancied all the time. I mean, we snuck in the playoffs on the last day um, and then obviously went on, to, went on to win them. And then in League Two, we just... Nobody liked coming to Rodney Parade. Justin played on that massively. Um, we were very much the underdogs in every game. And we all felt like that, especially myself, because I'd never played at any of any of these levels before against big teams like South End and um, te- teams in League Two like that. It was just a dream come true for me. So I was more than happy to take on the, the tag of the underdog. And like you say, I managed to, to thrive in that environment. Yeah, it's fascinating. You referenced the underdog tag and even just, you know, being a club situated in, in Wales, there's that added sort of element of like us against them. And I can only imagine that, yeah, playing at your home stadium would have been a massive, massive advantage. But on to your next club, Peterborough. And they're a team that have had really some great strikers down the years, the likes of Aaron McLean, Craig McHale Smith, Dwight Gale, Britt Asambolonga, Ivan Tony more recently. So Fans of the posh, as they're called, are accustomed to seeing good forwards in their sides. And Connor, you're another name on that list. Did it feel especially good to do well there, given that you were snubbed by Peterborough in your childhood? And I suppose beyond that, maybe, were there actually still any individuals left at the club who perhaps didn't rate you the first time round that you were able to, you know, then go and, and prove wrong all those years later? Yeah, so, so when I went on trial, obviously, I, I was it was pretty much just before I signed for Newport, to be fair, not not too much before that. And it was to train with the under-23s at the time. So I didn't really have any contact with the first team. I think, funny enough, Johnson Clark Harris was actually on trial there the same time I was there. And there was a defender called Michael Richens, who was still there when I was there as well. Um, but no, not too many. So I was involved with the 23s. And I actually only went to one day at that trial as well. Um because I didn't want to play under 23s football. I was very much, I I don't have the game for that, that type of football. It's so different to men's football. I thought I'd be better served just keep doing what I was doing, really, playing playing local football and, and hopefully trying to sort of sneak it. I think they were in the championship at the time as well. So I was hoping for a, a conference league too, because I wanted to play. I didn't want to be a under 23s player who was going to be coached in a way that I'd never been coached. And it might detract from the better parts of my game that, that had served me well so far. So, and it was a great move for me. I mean, I had to go and beg Justin to let me leave, actually. Uh, it's not often you get to live so close to home for a start. Um, and where I live, that is about as close as you can get. So it was, uh, and obviously, like you say, the reputation they had of bringing in strikers, developing them and selling them was was a real big draw for me as well. Did it feel like a bit of a full circle you reference you know managing to play for one of the top clubs in your local area of your childhood was was there kind of a full circle kind of feeling not that you know obviously you've gone on since then and achieved more things as well but did it feel like somewhat of a crowning moment in your in your earlier career yeah I think every every move and every step I sort of made um was like was like a crowning moment because like I say I was never expected to do anything in football never mind get to the levels I've got to. So yeah, it's very much like just really appreciative of of everything that had gone on before it. And like you say, yeah, it did at the time moving back home um into my back into my local area with my friends and stuff whilst playing professional football would definitely it was definitely a big a big moment for me. Nice. Yeah. Playing, playing in your hometown must always be a great feeling, but of course you were playing so well as Peterborough strikers tend to do that. It was only a matter of time before a championship club would come calling. And in your case, it was QPR that came calling for you. So we've obviously spoken about the fact that previously in your career, you've made the move up from St. Ives to Newport, quite a few divisions. You've then got promoted with Newport. You then made again, the move up to league one with Peterborough, but obviously the championship is, uh, well, it's, a, it's one of the best leagues in the world, aside from some of the, the top flight leagues out there. And actually, I think one of your ex-teammates, David Wheeler, once said to us about the difficulty in kind of making that move up from, I think, in his case, League Two to the championship. Yeah, from, from your perspective, Connor, how different is playing in the championship compared to playing in League One? Yeah, it's very different. 
Um, at the time, I did genuinely wouldn't have said I noticed a particular, I think because at Peterborough, we had a very good team. So the standard of training, et cetera, wasn't a massive step up. It was a step up, no doubt about it, to, to QPR. But I've never been the best trainer anyway, to be honest. Strikers mm-hmm. usually aren't. So um, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, but yeah, in terms of like the actual league is very different. I think it's probably even more different now. Uh, by the time I'd left after sort of two or three about three seasons, obviously, including the Sheffield United season, it was it it was a totally different league to what I'd come into. I mean, everyone's like I think obviously you had Neves playing for Wolves, um, Yotta was there, Cavalero, John Joe Shelby for, for Newcastle. Um it was a crazy league, really. I think it's it's only getting better all the time. I mean, people are spending tens of millions of pounds on players in the championship, and that that's just unheard of. So um yeah, the stand is totally different now. And I think the golf is getting bigger. We've definitely noticed that. Obviously, coming back down to playing League One from, from up in Scotland, uh, from the Sheffield United year, yeah, it's, it's just totally different. It's not even not even remotely close anymore, I, I would say. And it, it's probably, it probably shows with the teams that go up because more often than not, that they do struggle. Yeah, no, you're right. There tends to be, a, there's a few clubs in that kind of, I don't know, the Norwiches and the Fulhams who are, West Broms, I guess, who go up and down and it's a little cycle clubs get into. But You mentioned there as well, obviously, QPR was where you played for the majority of your time in the championship, but you would go on to play for Sheffield United for a bit too, um, the season that um, they would go up to the Premier League. And obviously the manager of that team was Chris Wilder, who's received a lot of plaudits. And I know obviously things didn't go that well for him this year, but I assume he'll be back in the job sooner rather than later. What were your personal experiences of um, playing under Chris Wilder? Uh, I didn't really play a lot, to be honest. It was great to be a part of it. Um, and it was a real eye- eye-opener to me that that was the levels of intensity, technical ability and application that that gets you to that next level, which is the Premier League. Um, and I've sort of taken that into, into the rest of my career since then, to be honest. And Chris Wilder gave me real glowing um, references because it's sort of one of the proudest proudest years of my career, to be honest, as probably as strange as that sounds, because I think I only played about six games worth of minutes in total, but I played a lot of 23s games. I was keeping myself fit. I was asking to play in those games. And like every day in training, I was 100% at it every day. Um, and a lot of that was just being part of the group, to be honest. And um, it served me really well that year because I managed to get a good move off the back of it, having not really played and not really done anything when I had played, to be honest. So, um, yeah, that's probably one of the proudest years of my career, knowing knowing that I sort of didn't didn't toss it off at any point and, and whatever. But, I mean, as a man manager, um, I wouldn't say he's particularly close to many of the players. I think he's very, very good tactically um, and knows how to put a, real, a really good group together and knows how to get the best out of that group. Um, he was very much just if you're not playing um, come and see me if not just get on with it sort of thing he's, he's no different to how he's in the media to be honest he's very straightforward straight talking and um, but yeah great, great to work under and another another good experience for me well on from Sheffield United and you've you've mentioned it already that you had a year up in Scotland in Edinburgh with Hearts and um Obviously, at the beginning of last season, you joined Charlton, your current club, where I think you scored 11 goals in the league, which is more than you managed in, I want to say, the previous three seasons combined. I know there was a lack of playing time at Sheffield United, and um, I think up in Scotland, you might have had your fair share of injuries as well. So beyond that, what what's clicking for you at Charlton at the minute? What what do you put the recent upturn in, in goals down to? Uh, I think just a lot of it is getting back out onto the pitch, to be honest. I mean, Sheffield United, I was... Fourth choice striker most of the time I was there behind three very, very good strikers. I mean, the position I would have played in would have obviously been Billy Sharps, who is an incredible player, goal scorer, captain of the club, etc. So, um, and then in heart, the hearts, like you say, we never really got going as a club, to be honest. We had a really torrid season. I missed like five months through injury and then got hit with COVID as well. I think I only probably played about maybe 10 or 15 games. So, I think I'd scored two in the last three and then or scored two in two and then played St Mirren and that was the last game. So I just about felt like I was getting up to speed in that respect. And then obviously to get hit with COVID and whatever. And then I think um, 
Charlton's a really good fit for me. Obviously, I've scored a lot of goals at this level before. Um, I feel comfortable at this level. Not that I don't in the championship, but I think there's probably more goals to be had, I would I would argue, in League One. Um, I, I feel very comfortable in my own skin um, at the minute. I'm, I know what I'm good at as a player and I don't feel like I have to prove that to anyone anymore. And um, Probably been a bit more demanded of my teammates in terms of the sort of service I need. And luckily, we've we've done half decent this year as well. It's obviously always easier to score goals when you're in and around the top half, and not fighting relegation in the SPL. So, um, but yeah, I, I definitely should have scored more and I would like to score more. Um, so it's a case of keep working hard on those parts of my game and I obviously want to improve on that next year. Yeah, I mean, that's the right attitude and I'm sure the goals will continue to, to flow. Otherwise, I think one last question about your club career and as someone who's played in England, Wales and Scotland, do you have any sort of opinion on the culture surrounding football in those places? Is there much of a difference at all? Is it pretty negligible? Did you enjoy certain parts of playing in Wales? We kind of alluded to that earlier with the the passion of and the pride of the supporters, but likewise up in Scotland, were there parts of those experiences that you are really glad that you had because you wouldn't otherwise have had them in England? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've not... I've not had the, the luxury of playing in front of Charlton fans as of yet, but the two clubs that, that stick out and obviously the national team as well um, would be Hearts and Sheffield United in terms of passion and um, they breathe, live, breathe football. Um, I mean, Edinburgh is an unbelievable city in itself and the football side of it is brilliant. Um, they're so demanding, but you, you get to a certain age where you, you want that. You don't want a team that's just going to uh, sorry, a, a group of supporters that's going to roll up and just moan and groan and, and whatever. Like these people are desperate to be on that pitch kicking the ball for you. So they're, they're the best ones to play in front of. Um, they might give you a tough time when it's not going well. But on the flip side of that, when 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 they when you need them, they'll give you absolutely everything. We we definitely saw that at Sheffield United, and it was a shame that we didn't give the Hearts fans more more things to cheer, to be honest. Yeah, well, you know, the impact of the fans at Sheffield United is all too apparent given how well they were doing pre-COVID and sadly, yeah, the didn't really quite work out for them this year without the fans. But um, I'm sure next year at the at the Valley, once the fans turn up, it's going to be even louder than normal. Everyone's going to just be so happy um, to be back. But yeah, Connor, we do have a couple more questions and we, of course, we have to ask you not just about your um, club career, but about your international career too, which is, of course, for... Um, Northern Ireland, a country you qualify um, through through some of your relatives. So you've obviously, I mean, hopefully it's not over yet, your time for Northern Ireland, but you've um, you've been in the squad at Euro 2016, you've made nearly 30 appearances, you've scored a few goals for Northern Ireland. Um, so, you know, you're very much part of that Northern Ireland football culture now. But prior to playing for the national side, what was your kind of connection like with Northern Ireland? Had you been there much and sort of na- I guess as a second part, going forward, does Northern Ireland feel like a home from home for you? So my grandparents had moved over to around York sort of area, Ripon they were. So uh, my grandma's seriously Northern Irish. I couldn't understand a lot of what she said, to be honest. And um, she talked that quickly. But um, yeah, she was really proud. Um really proud to have been from there and um, my dad obviously was as well so when obviously I've always known I was eligible but there was no point shouting from the rooftops about it when I was playing for Newport for example so it wasn't until Peter Barr that my agent got in contact with the Irish FA and said listen I'm eligible and I'd like to put my name forward for for selection basically and obviously I ended up getting a move to QPR and probably a much more attractive um, proposition, obviously, as, as a striker. So that's how that worked out. And yeah, like you say, the, it definitely does feel like a home from home. I, I love going over there. Um, we stay in a beautiful hotel. Um, and it's just a lovely place, to be honest. And the people are absolutely brilliant, uh, from the football fans to just the general population. It's just a, it was similar to Scotland, to be honest. They're just, you just know what you're getting with these people. And they're very honest and upfront. And the, you, you get what you're given really and if you give out good positive vibes and that's that's usually what you get back from from those countries yeah it's impressive you've done the entire kind of 
United Kingdom football experience of England, Scotland, Wales, and, and Northern Ireland, um, which I doubt, yeah, too many players can say that they've they've done. Um, but otherwise, onto your education, which you seem to be, you know, juggling with with a playing career. What is the plan with your sports science degree in the long term? And I know you said that you aren't or weren't the best trainer, but has the knowledge that you've learned from these courses already helped you in the short term as a currently active footballer? Yeah, for sure. I mean, in terms of like being a good trainer, I mean, I'm 100% full throttle, but the technical side of it, passing drills, A, do not interest me, B, are not the best part of my game. So, um, but I'll give them my best shot, basically. But the fitness side of it's always interested me. It was something that interested me before I started playing professionally. I've always been a, a big gym goer. So, um, the, the plan, I sort of flip-flop between a few different ideas. Um, working in football is tough with sports science because the contact time and you obviously you're always at the mercy of the manager and if I'm honest like the hours aren't great being being in football um there's no certainties for example and I think by the time I get to the end of my career I probably have had enough of that and I know for sure that my wife will have had enough of that by then as well so um I'm, I'm half thinking teaching at the moment uh, is probably probably the, the avenue I'd like to go down my PE teachers were a real big um, had a real big impact on my life and I, stay, I still speak to them now so um, something like that I would I'd like to probably jump into because it fits with family life as well it's a really important aspect of my life um, I want to be there and present for, for my family so obviously half terms and holidays and stuff absolutely brilliant um, but will that change in the next five or six years probably again and I'll probably flip back and, and forward but at the moment, I'm just enjoying learning again, to be honest. It's, and it's stuff that I'm passionate about. So this uh, makes it a hell of a lot easier. Fantastic. Well, I mean, we look forward to seeing what you do in your post-career. But obviously, um, hopefully, there's still many a year left in, in the football just yet. But um, that does bring us to the end of today's podcast. So as always, a big thank you to my co-host, Kaitel. And of course, a very special thank you from the both of us to Connor. And Connor, we hope that you've enjoyed being our guest. How can the listeners best follow you? And do you have any messages for any Charlton supporters that might be listening to this too? Uh, I don't actually know any of my handles. I'm usually boring people on Twitter with <laughs> something something terribly uh, uninteresting. And my Instagram is pretty much the same, to be honest. Um but in terms of the Charlton fans, I mean, I think we've sold nearly nine thousand, eight or nine thousand season tickets already, and I think it's just going to be it's just going to be great to play in front of them. To be honest, and we can't wait as a as a squad. And obviously, I've been there nearly twelve months now. And I've not I've only played in front of maybe a thousand fans. I think we had at the time. So I'm just re just raring to go with it. To be honest, and I think there's going to be like you said earlier, a hell of a lot of built up emotion. We we'll call it emotion, um, but. We're, we're all looking forward to that. It'd be nice to be shouted at, to be honest. Be not, instead of the instead of being shouted at by the manager and the, the coaching staff, it'd be Steve from down the road, which is much more fun. Yeah, well, thanks again, Connor. Don't worry about getting your your handles out there. We'll take care of that. We'll tag you in a, in our in our content and whatnot, so you could, you'll be able to find Connor Washington on Twitter and Instagram that way. Otherwise, uh, best of luck to you and Charlton. Uh, good luck with your studies as well, and best wishes to you and, and your family. As far as our listeners and viewers. We hope that you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, please do follow or subscribe wherever it is that you found us. We are United Mates Football Podcast on all of your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Same name on YouTube where you can put some faces to these voices. On social media, we're at United Mates FP across Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Please follow us there. And then for all of the above content and some very niche and amusing articles, you can check out the website, unitedmatesfp.com. And please subscribe to our newsletter there. Until next time, everyone, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Goodbye.